Hello and welcome to Learn ADS in 5 Minutes. This is tutorial 61 on Transient Simulator Advanced Techniques. In this video, we will talk about how do we handle situation when we have time and frequency domain models. Now, Before we start, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell icon to enable all the notifications and after you watch the video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and colleagues. All right, so let's go ahead and understand some of these advanced technique which will help you in performing accurate simulation of the time domain uh, when you have frequency domain components. So in the last video, we went over some initial basics of transient simulation. We did cover concept of setting up the right time step, choosing the appropriate integration method depending upon what kind of circuit you're trying to analyze. Now, whenever you have these kind of frequency domain models, such as this transmission line or an S-parameter model, and typically S-parameter models would be band limited. That means you will have a certain bandwidth in those models. And depending on the bandwidth you have and the kind of analysis you're running, you need to, uh, most of the time, ensure you have sufficient bandwidth to perform an accurate analysis. And that is what we are going to talk about in this video. Now, most of those settings is done under convolution tab because whenever you run a time domain simulation and you have a frequency domain model, the way internal mechanics works is ADS will take the impulse response of the frequency domain models and then it will perform a convolution with the time domain to get you the, the overall response of the circuit. Under convolution, if you click on advanced setting, uh, there are some default settings available here and they can be fine tuned by the user depending upon what he's looking for. So before we come here, let's go ahead and run a normal simulation and then I will go and dig deeper into the concepts and the knobs which you can turn. Now here on the same schematic, I do have a second bench. And in that bench, I have a same line which I'm using here. The only difference is this is coming out of a transmission line library. And this one, a band limited data. Currently, I do have you know, S parameter till 10 gigahertz. Now the sources are exactly the same. Both are set to 5 Gbps, 50 or 50 uh, rise and fall time, and uh, the RJ introduces two picosecond, just to give it a little more realistic eye diagram look. Now once you go ahead and run this simulation, ideally you would expect the responses to be same, but let's see what happens. So now if I just make a copy of these two uh, results which we have here and we change the V out uh, voltage to node 2 which is the second output and also the I probe name is I probe 2. Now look at the, the differences between the response. You can see in time domain voltage you can see some kind of ripple appearing along the edges and also the I diagram looks very different than what you are getting from a transmission line model. Now, the advantage of using transmission line models is there is no apparent frequency limit. So whatever you need, it will be extracted. And the detail of that is typically can be seen in the, in the status window of simulation. So here you can see the response of S parameter is limited to 10 gigahertz, whereas the transmission line, there is no frequency limit. So we are able to extract the model till 40 gigahertz, which is needed for accurate impulse response and then uh, further into convolution process. So having the data, which is less than the required optimum bandwidth will give you the distortion in the results. So it's not that your circuit is bad or your simulation you know, setup is bad. It's just that you don't have enough data to produce the accurate result. Now, in the same case, if we go ahead and switch on a 20 gigahertz model, so now we have the same as parameter file, but now till 20 gigahertz. Now, if we run the analysis, um, you can compare. The I diagram looks pretty similar. Also, the voltage waveforms looks pretty similar. And if we plot the I probe summary, of um, you know second uh, I probe in there, you can see the results are exactly the same. So that means you have sufficient amount of bandwidth in your data to produce an accurate result. 
Now, another knobs which you can, you know, you know, switch on while running these kind of analysis, because many a times it is interesting to see what kind of impulse response was calculated and how well it is aligned to the, you know, kind of uh, typical transmission line which we have used. And in this case, again, let me remind you, is the same data. Uh, so this as parameter data is extracted exactly for the same transmission line. The only variance is the stop frequency. That means the bandwidth in this parameter file. Under transient controller in convolution tab, if we go ahead and switch on save impulse spectrum, so it will now save the impulse response and the frequency response of the channel, which we can then plot. So here, if I insert a new graph, you can see a lot of these new measurements which are appearing. So CMP1 uh, related measurements belong to the S parameter file. And if we go down, you will have TL1, which is belonging to the transmission line. Now, if we go ahead and plot uh, TL1 FFT imp you know, impulse, this is basically the frequency domain data of the transmission line. And here you can see the transmission line's frequency response till 40 gigahertz because that's the frequency it was characterized to. Now, if we double click and plot uh, component one FFT impulse response uh, for two one, which is the transmission. Now you can notice the blue trace is only up to 20 gigahertz because that's the maximum frequency available in your S parameter file. And uh, the frequency response is matching uh, quite well. Now we can insert another plot and we can now compare uh, the impulse response of these two models. So here I do have CMP1 and you do have an impulse response. So if I plot CMP1 underscore impulse, you will see impulse response for the S parameter. And also for transmission line, uh, we can go ahead and select a TL1 impulse to one. And now you can compare the impulse response. So let's try to zoom in a little bit closer. And you can see the impulse response is slightely different, but the frequency response is pretty much well aligned. And also the high diagram is exactly the same. So, so some of these um, you know, lower level controls will dominate the way your simulation is done. Now, finally, I have another S parameter file, which is still 40 gigahertz. Now, when I run this simulation, I expect response to be nearly identical. So let's go ahead and simulate our performance. And now you can notice the impulse response is almost overlapping. The I diagram, as we would expect, is exactly the same. The time domain waveform is same. And also, if you look at frequency response of the channel, they are overlapping on top of each other. And both of these now have data till 40 gigahertz for you available. So some of these handles are pretty useful when you deal with frequency domain models having the right amount of bandwidth, which is exactly the same constraint like you would have on your oscilloscope. If you want to measure, uh, you know, or if you want to select an oscilloscope, you know the criteria we use, which is 0.35 divided by rise time. That's the bandwidth of oscilloscope you need to have depending upon the kind of signal you want to measure. And in transient simulation, it is no different. That's the minimum guideline, 0.35 divided by TR. That's the minimum bandwidth you will need to perform an accurate analysis to at least cover the third harmonic of the signal uh, for appropriate eye diagram analysis. Now, there are some other handles in transient uh, simulation. For example, if you have uh, you know a lot of uh, these kind of transmission line in the circuit you're analyzing, this setting is very helpful so that if you have a very, very small transmission line, your your uh, time step of the transient simulation, you know, doesn't go very, very small, which in turn might have a convergence problem or the simulation will take a lot of time. Similarly, in convolution, you have enforced passivity option switch on, and this option uh, will ensure all the frequency domain components get specified in case there is some problem in the model of the transmission line which you might be using. Now for S parameter, this enforced passivity uh, gets overwritten by the passivity criteria in the S parameter file. 
So if you go to display and um, you know if you look under parameters, you do have enforced passivity check here. Now if it is set to no, the enforced passivity check in the transient controller will not be used because the setting uh, in this parameter component is uh, the dominant uh, you know, factor here. Now, when you're dealing with a simple transmission line or interconnect as parameter model, uh, such as via package, et cetera, it's always a good idea to enforce the passivity in the S parameter component. But if you're dealing with something like a transistor device, which has a gain inbuilt, so of course that cannot be passive because your S21 is greater than one. So in those cases, you should always set it to no. Uh, for a proper uh, simulation. Now, most of these things are very well documented. So if you look in the help of the transient controller, so let me go back here and click to transient, click on the help. Now in the transient controller, you have this section called setting up convolution analysis. All the parameters are very well explained. So I always recommend everyone to read through this documentation understand those parameters and that will help you immensely in setting up a very accurate uh, you know time domain analysis while dealing with band limited data at your disposal that's all for this video i hope you like the content presented and some of these tricks will be very useful when you go out and perform your own time domain analysis thanks a lot for watching and wish you all the best